My name is Douglas Dodds. I'm a curator at the BNA, and I'm particularly grateful to Laura and to Ernest for inviting me to take part in the proceedings today. Um, I'm especially grateful to Laura, actually, for calling me a curator from a younger generation, which um, was worth the trip just, just for that alone. Um, anyway, if you don't mind, I'll just say a couple of words about the VNA and what we've been doing in this area before we go on to talk to Ernest. Um, over the last number of years now, we've been building up a large collection of works that document the early history of digital art and design. Um, we put on a show in 2009, 2010 called Digital Pioneers. And um, as a result of that show, we've attracted more and more similar works by artists throughout the world. So um, all of the artists that are represented today uh, are also represented in the V&A's collections. And if you want to know more about them, you can search online on our website and also our collections database where pretty much everything is, is documented. Um, that's the end of the commercial advert. <laughs> um, if you've had the opportunity already to go down the road and see the exhibition at the Sala Gallery, then um, Ernest doesn't need any uh, introduction at all from me. We've also been seeing the, the images on the, the screen above us. Um, and um, Leila's al already mentioned a few things about, about his work, but um, as she said, um, he essentially operates within what he calls a constructivist tradition. Um, and I've been asking more about that in a minute. Um, many people still think that digital art started yesterday, or maybe five years ago. In fact, um, Ernest's been working with computers since 1968, and the history of the medium goes back even further than that. Um, Ernest's work, though, is, is very much concerned with colour, with <coughs> minimal forms, and especially in relation to time and space and interaction. Um, he and Stroud Corner exhibited their first interactive work in 1970, and Ernest's first generative video construct as he called it, was shown in 1985. Uh, as we've heard already, he's exhibited throughout the world. Um, he's currently director of the Institute for Creative Technologies at De Montfort University in Leicester. And he's also editor-in-chief of Leonardo Transactions. Um, one of Ernest's responsive digital works, Shaping Form, is currently on display in the V&A's New Acquisitions Gallery. So if you're in London, you can see it there, but you can see rather more of them in the exhibition at the side here in Sheffield. Um, we do hold quite a large collection of his works, and we're in the process of uh, acquiring more. Some of those are actually, again, in, in the show at the side gallery. Um, we also showed his work quite recently in an exhibition in Sweden called, Dig in Sweden, Swindon, called uh, Digital Transformations. In addition to making art himself, Ernest is also heavily involved in um, academic activity. Um, he's particularly well known, I think, for promoting what's known as practice-based art research. And again, we might touch upon that in a minute. So I'm going to talk to the man himself, if that's all right. Uh, we've never done this before, have we? No. Practice. No, so. no, only have a coffee. <laughs> who, who knows how it's going to go? Let's pretend we're just having a cup of coffee. Yes. <laughs> um, First of all, just to clarify things, this event's organised by the side in conjunction with the Montfort University, but here we are in Sheffield. Can, can you just say why that is? Well, start with the second point. We're in here in Sheffield really because Laura invited me to put the show on mm -hmm. and we grew it in around that. And so thank you, Laura, and everyone for that. Uh, and in any case, the site gallery is a location I've always uh, valued over many years. So I'm very pleased about that. The De Montfort connection, uh, it's worth me just a couple of sentences about that. Because De Montfort University used to be called Leicester Polytechnic. And I started my academic career at Leicester Polytechnic. And it was there that I worked on that first interactive piece that you mentioned. Mm. And lots of stuff went <coughs> on around about 1970 in, around, and connected to Leicester Polytechnic. Mm -hmm. And it was there where I first started uh, a research approach to uh, 
art practice. Uh, and it just so happens, by some strange chance, that I'm back there again now. <laughs> and, but because of that history, De Montfort University is very, very interested uh, in this area because it is one of the founding institutions in this country who, who've worked on what we're discussing today. Right. The theme of today is to do with the use of code or programming uh, to make art. Um, first of all, can you just tell us something about the art movements that you've actually been influenced by yourself? You know, in particular, you talked about that constructivist tradition. Um, perhaps you could explain what you mean by that. Yeah, well, it's a very complicated story, uh, which I am not the most qualified person to tell. But if I could just pick an important moment out, really, in the constructivist tradition, um, really, uh, it was when the people who became known as the constructivists were meeting in Moscow in, I think, 1920 or there, just before and after, and were discussing new ways of making art, and made this contrast between composition and construction. And actually, it turned out they didn't really know what they meant by it, <laughs> and they had lots of arguments and so on. But however, the real thrust of it that I took away was this move away from just looking at the appearance of the work and its composition, and for example, using perspective or the golden mean or something to determine the appearance of the work, but to look and place more emphasis on the construction process of going from the concept of the work to the completed work. So it's moving, if you like, from mm -hmm. the object to the process. Mm -hmm. And so, and it made lots of great art. Mm -hmm. And it's the most important development in the 20th century to me, mm -hmm. in the visual arts. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you think about it, uh, it meant that the artists who, who took that line were ready for computer programs mm -hmm. when computer programming mm -hmm. appeared. Because they operated in that sort of system so be, be, yeah. before they had the technology to do it. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Malevich, for example, uh, actually published uh, an article called On Systems in Art, mm -hmm. uh, which, if you look at it carefully, does sort of prefigure some of what followed mm -hmm. in this area. So basically, in addition to there being a very strong long history now of digital art, there's also a very long history of constructivist art. Yeah, so, I mean, in fact, I'd like to, to, to make the point that, to me, digital art isn't very important in the sense that mm -hmm. being digital isn't really what's interesting. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of digital art which hasn't got, has got nothing to do with what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. and what's really important is the invention of computation which was up by Alan Turing, by the way, this is the 100th year uh, of his anniversary of his birth. Mm -hmm. And Alan Turing invented this notion, there's a long story behind it, of computation, showed that programming was possible, basically. Um, and that conceptual step is much, much more important mm -hmm. in the context that we're discussing today than you know, the physical object of the computer mm -hmm. and being digital. Mm -hmm. Were there any artists that you particularly admired who didn't necessarily work with computers but had a sort of affinity to what you wanted to do? Yes, and I mean, maybe one should just get out of the way that, as most artists would say, the big influence was Cezanne, uh, who made me want to paint anyway, um, and then perhaps um, followed very much by uh, Matisse, whose organisation of colour and so on made me want to do this. But then following on from that, I think um, an artist who I got to know and was most important to me uh, in this country uh, who didn't use computers but said he wished he'd been younger it was uh, Kenneth Martin, who was born in Sheffield. So that's another good reason for being here. A very important British artist who actually used procedures in making his art. So his work uh, did follow these, these methods. And he went to the art school here as well. Indeed, he did. <laughs> um, you started to touch on this already, but what were the motivating factors that led you to? connect with technology and actually begin to write code? Well, uh, first of all, I began writing code just uh, to pass the time of day while I had a, a job in, a, in Leicester Polytechnic and they, they acquired this thing called a computer, mm -hmm. which was in a room about this size. And I thought, that looks interesting, I'll just have a play with it because I was bored that day, kind of thing. 
So that wasn't motivating except to pass the time. Um, and then, um, but I actually found it useful. Um, and I suppose the important point in this context is that I was trying to make a painting, a relief painting, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of difficulty organizing it the way I wanted. Basically, I couldn't find a way of doing it, and I realized that I could write a computer program mm -hmm. to help me do it. Mm -hmm. So I, that got me interested, and then I started to think about the intellectual consequences of this computer and computation for art, just like um, one might think of, you know, we've now got canvas or we've now got oil paint, what does that mean? So I was thinking, well, we've now got computers and we've now got programming, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, do you remember being influenced by any particular thinking, you know, outside of the sort of art sphere? Yes, I, um, slightly obscure, really, but some kind of um, tension between uh, Wittgenstein and uh, philosophy of mathematics, mm -hmm. about which he said things that a lot of philosophers of mathematics didn't agree with. But anyway, um, so maybe I'll pick out two things. Uh, one is uh, something known as finitist mathematics. Mm -hmm. This is the notion that everything that is meaningful in mathematics can be done through a finite number of steps, no matter how many steps that might take. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as a long story here, we could take all day on that one point. So maybe I'll skip on to that. But it's a very, very important point, and it's the foundation of all the thinking that led to computing, in fact. So it's a very important point. And then, looking at the application of that in all kinds of other fields, uh, the, there's a field called systems theory, not so much systems art, mm -hmm. but systems theory, which really came out of biology and was trying to describe living systems and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, using something which, although no one talked about it like this, really were these kind of finitist methods, philosophically. Mm -hmm. And systems theory uh, dealt with um, if you like living organisms, it's actually used in management, uh, social organisms, not just bodies and animals and so on. Um, but it dealt with how things change in time, how one thing influenced another, how one thing interacted with another and so on. Uh, and so I became very interested in this. Uh, and its application, in my case, I was particularly interested in its application in the early development of infants, yeah. as it happens. Um, and so these kind of thoughts, were provided an intellectual backdrop, mm -hmm. if you like, uh, which was something to explore yeah. as part of our practice. Yeah. It's worth perhaps mentioning that you did actually train as a mathematician yeah, initially. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember reading somewhere that you said that um, you found it quite easy to do, so you had a bit of spare time to do your art while you were also doing mathematics. Yeah, the reason I chose mathematics as a degree was because I found I could do it in 10 hours a week, and that left <laughs> plenty of time. <laughs> Paint. A bit of doodling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, but actually, I, I discovered logic, and I st also studied philosophy as part of that. And the logic and the philosophy proved very valuable to me, and still do. When did you first gain access to computers? And what did you first try and do? Uh, I first gained access to computers early in 1968. Mm -hmm. That was this computer at Leicester Polytechnic. Uh, and the first thing I, I did was try to make it say hello, which is what everyone does, mm -hmm. that's what you're supposed to do. Um, hello digital artwork. Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. But the second thing I did is I, was, I um, was trying to solve a problem in logic. It was my job at the day, I was doing some research in mathematical logic. And I um, worked out how to prove a theorem in mathematical logic by writing a computer program. The theorem didn't involve computers. That wouldn't have been acceptable in the world of logic. But I worked out how to write the theorem. I then wrote the theorem and published it in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, which was a, you know, the best place to publish mm -hmm. that sort of thing in those days. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that proved the computer could really be helpful yeah. uh, in an intellectual pursuit. Mm -hmm. I think I probably know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. Does music also play a large part in your work? Yeah, I mean, um, I would have preferred to have been a musician uh -huh. than a visual artist, but I'm not good enough. <laughs> um, so I love music. I love music and I was very influenced by music in my thinking. And um, the, my early work was very much influenced, I would say, by 
the 20th century tradition, starting with Schoenberg and particularly Weber, and going through to Pierre Boulez mm -hmm. and that particular uh, strand of music. I love all sorts of other music, but that particular strand mm -hmm. had a lot of influence on me in terms of the way that I made my art. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of that strand, it is actually um, getting, being more, using systems in more and more way. And of course, in the end, Boulez set up Urkan, mm -hmm. which is a very important research centre in musical art form, mm -hmm. uh, exploring new technology in the making of new music. Some of us were privileged, I think, to witness an event last night in connection with the opening of the show. Um, could you maybe just explain a bit more about what was going on? Oh, last night? Ah, yeah, well, we, so Mark Fell, who's here too, and I um, performed uh, a piece last night called Fibonacci Offset. Um, there are two things maybe to say uh, quickly about that. One is that Unlike the, what you see in the exhibition, which is stuff that's been worked on for years and maybe been stored and polished and whatever, this was a performance of a new piece. And it was more, so in a sense, um, it, I, see, I see all cut such performances as sort of experiments. It's like I see making a painting as an experiment. But if it doesn't work, I won't show it to you. But the performance is, of course, is, a, is an experiment in the public mm -hmm. place. Uh, and that gives it an edge and an excitement, right. which is quite different to the edge and the excitement yeah. that you get in an exhibition. So that's one thing yeah. to say yeah. that's important I think, yeah. to understand. Of all performance, really. Yeah. Yeah. But also people need to take time to grow into it and understand it. But, and the point about the piece, the piece is very, was completely systematic. Yeah. Right? You, and it, Fibonacci is a mathematical sequence that's been used for hundreds of years. Uh, by people for all kinds of purposes and was the basis of the way that we organised the piece. Mm -hmm. So it was very organised uh, and, and, and it was a kind of conversation between the visual and the oral uh, using the same structures in both uh, worlds and if you like part of the exploration is what happens when you bring those together. Mm -hmm. Do you form some mm -hmm. unity between them? Or can you find unities before between them? Mm -hmm. Or can you go away with a puzzle? Was there some, you know, something mm -hmm. that okay, so can it be stimulating in that sense? You're also interested in artificial intelligence. Can you explain more about that one? Uh, well, we have a great expert in artificial intelligence sitting in the front row here, so I'd be nervous to say too much <laughs> about that subject, in which I have dabbled over the years. Um, but um, I guess I've taken the view that uh, everything must be explicable somehow by some uh, determined system, which might almost certainly have to be an open system. I could explain that privately later if people don't know that term. Um, which leads to the question of how do very complex things happen uh, when, for example, I decide to put my, move my leg down here and I can fit it on the floor without, make, without falling over and making a big crash. Uh, how do I formulate this answer to this question? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you think what to say next, for example, all of these things? Well, there are processes going on yeah. that lead to all this. Yeah. So they're very interesting. Script. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, so, and one of the uh, conjectures in the 20th century or maybe uh, not the conjecture is too strong on that, but one of the interesting <coughs> things that's happened in the 20th century is that people have tried to use computational method methods to describe these mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. which ends up meaning writing programs that lead to behaviours in computer-based systems that somehow are like, mm -hmm. maybe are models of, or sometimes or limitations of, depending which strand you look at, uh, all these things. And now that interests me in art, let's just put it very simply. Um, life is, is a great source of the kind of meaning of art and to the artist, like what is it all about? Mm -hmm. And so looking at some of these mechanisms in this computational form is part of the, the substance, the food that you can put into your art, I think, mm -hmm. to explore. So I've always felt artificial intelligence was something which was a very kind of exciting uh, 
uh, endeavor. Not a, there's no particular solutions there, but I've got an endeavor. Uh, but was there a moment when you started to develop work that became the back, backbone to your practice? If so, why? What was it? I think it was when I made this painting, when I first um, used a computer program to organize the painting in 68. And I, I realized that this organizational process was almost more interesting than the other things that I was doing before. And so then I started to look at structure and process through computational eyes. Mm -hmm. So although that work isn't systematic in this way in a sense, it actually was a turning point in my thinking yeah. that led to like drawing type yes. wonders in the spring. What was that work again? It was called 19. Uh -huh. okay. I was going to ask you that as well. Um, when I first came across Ernest's work, I was a bit baffled by the, um, the terminology that he uses to describe the work. So 19, for example, is, is, is a good um, example of that. It's, it's actually got a grid of 20 um, objects on it, and yet it's called 19. So I struggled with this for a while, but this guy's a mathematician. He must know something that I don't about this. Perhaps you can explain why it's called 19. Well, first of all, I'm a logician. Um, and, uh, they say that there are um, three kinds of mathematician. Mm -hmm. Those that know arithmetic and those that don't. <laughs> um, however, um, uh, However, the, it, it was a nice point. It was, in fact, the 19th work that I've made since I started giving them a name by, a, by a, a, the word of a number. And it happened to have 20 pieces in it. And that I found rather exciting. So, but, and I kind of then started to stop doing it because that seemed to be yeah, the, the, the numbers didn't add up anymore. No, exactly. Or you couldn't keep count. No, exactly. <laughs> um, is it possible to say what you think were the key works that you created? You know, are there two or three that you'd want people to look at as being the most representative examples of what you've done? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. And I always say the one I've almost finished. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that it hasn't kind of quite come out yet. But I did something, uh, I forget the exact year now, but 1970, 71, called Communication Gang. Mm -hmm. And this was an artwork uh, which enabled people to interact with one another through the work. So people were interacting with one another, in, they were in different spaces, and using this work to interact with one another. That was before the internet, so it wasn't internet art, mm -hmm. we didn't have the internet, and in fact the connections weren't actually for a computer, I actually built a logic circuit mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. But it was a starting point of something that was pretty critical, I think, mm -hmm. and, and I have explored but today I explore it using the internet and all that stuff. So maybe that was quite um, an important work. And that's I, a work at Millbank, next to the turn. Yes, well, yeah. And I think another important work was the first shape and form, which is the very first one is the one that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that's on show in the BNA at the moment, mm -hmm. which was um, the first work that I completed where I used a, a rather different notion of interaction. So the computer is analyzing what's going on in front of the computer, but it's affecting the behavior of the computer in the future, and not just at that moment. Right. And so that was perhaps um, mm -hmm. pretty critical. Mm -hmm. And what about Jasper? Okay, well, okay, well, Jasper, that's, okay, right. In the early 80s, I found out, that, and this came through artificial intelligence indirectly, actually. I found out that a, a computer language that AI people used called Prolog uh, had a great property that I could use, which is that it searched for a goal. You, you could set it up to search for a goal, and you could see the search happening if you wish to. And so I, and I found a way of making uh, like abstract film, <coughs> and the abstract film was actually a record of the search through a visual space mm. and made these films. And so one of the early ones was this film, Jasper, mm. which is on show in the gallery, uh, and it's a black and white film uh, that uh, was, was landed directly for a computer on the videotape. It was one of the early pieces that anyone did like that, making, making film in real time, as it were, mm -hmm. onto videotape. Mm -hmm. But it had another thing which is important, which is, uh, and you can see this in the exhibition, 
that I could only use black and white on the screens because in those days, color was very, you had color screens, but it was terribly unreliable. Every time you turned the screen on, the colors were different, which was not much satisfying. So I painted paintings to try to explore how the color would be if only I could get the color right in those paintings, or some of those paintings are in the show. And which led me to be able to think about it, to move on once the technology improved to using color. Yeah. So that was a kind of, so actually you're, you're right to raise that because that was an important step where I've had to move aside from color because of the technology. Yeah, because the technology wasn't good enough. The technology, the technology wasn't good it. enough. Yeah. And that was a kind of step yeah. where I moved back. This is one of the just And you're not the only artist who was in that position. I mean, Absolutely. Chrome, not. for example, is another example. No. Somebody wouldn't use color because the computer wasn't capable of sure. delivering it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was a technological reality we all had to face. Yeah. Um, we're going to open up the questions from the floor in a second, but maybe I could just ask one last one. Uh, I, I know you've taught numerous up and coming artists yourself. Um, is it possible to identify what they perceive as the differences in approach that have evolved over the years? Um, you know, what what's code got to do with art today? I think that um, the uh, there are, there are many, many strands here, but I think that perhaps the most important thing is a move towards understanding systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, code used not just like one piece of code to, to go from here to here, but many pieces of code in many, many uh, devices or computational objects mm -hmm. that kind of communicate with one another. And the whole notion has grown up in computer science. So in the computer science world, uh, you have this distinction between those think people who think it's all about programming and those people who think it's all about systems and the organization of many systems and how one thing connects to another and so on. And the second view is, is a view which I see uh, a great concern to many young artists mm -hmm. today, which is an interesting development. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to open it up to questions. You already told a little bit about that during the conversation, but. Uh, the connection between the work that you were doing before starting using computers and after, uh, how is it the influence of one into the other or how did this um, way uh, work out? How did you, you work out the way from uh, before to the computer and why? Yeah. In a sense, I was trying to do the same thing at the beginning that I'm trying to do now. And uh, what I wanted to do was make something as good as a late Cezanne. But I didn't know how to do it, and I still don't. <laughs> and I never will, I'm sure. No pressure. <laughs> uh, um, and so I was exploring ways of organizing uh, the surface of a painting, or it might have been relief or whatever, it doesn't matter. But I was trying to organize color and form uh, uh, in ways that provided the challenge uh, the excitement, the edge uh, that, that art should have. And what happened when I found a computer is I found ways of doing it that were more successful to me. And this is, I believe, partly because um, we cannot think, a blank canvas and an empty mind and a paint pot is no way to start making art. Um, and it's no way to start doing anything. We need to somehow uh, reduce the range of decisions that we have to make to something that the human brain can cope with, if you like. Uh, and the, uh, and the pro procedures and processes that we could use in computers could help me do that. But there's one extra thing, which is I always wanted to do, but never did before, which is work in time. I love music and so on. And I had no way of doing that. In fact, I did. I did make little movies and so on by this way that people used to do, by you did one frame, and then the next frame, and then the next frame. And when you'd done 24, you managed a second or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I, so I did that sort of thing, but it was completely hopeless to me. Uh, but the computer enabled me to do it like for real. And in particular, to do the process so that you could kind of make a moving, a time-based piece and you could work with it. So you could make it and see it and decide that this wasn't quite right and you could adjust it and so on. And it was like doing five years filmmaking work in a day, more or less. So that's another important. 
Yeah, how, how important oh, is any important to the, the actual rules and logics that you use to uh, create the final forms and so on to be actually visible or, or you know, in any way in the final piece, or are you just purely interested in the sort of material outcome uh, and the, the formal outcomes of the rules? Right. This is a very important question, by the way. We won't have time to deal with properly, mm -hmm. but let me just try to give you a quick answer. Um, so the rules are crucial. I mean, the art is actually made from that. And there are people who are interested in ways of making those rules very, very obvious. The most um, well-known current activity is in music called live coding, where people show the program on screen while they're actually changing the program. So you're listening to the music, seeing the program, and so on and so forth. Which doesn't quite work in the sense that you're referring to, because mostly people can't understand by looking at that code what the structure really is anyway. But that's, a, you know, so people are addressing the problem. That's a way that people are addressing <coughs> the problem today. I don't know. I mean, I think, really, in the end, uh, it's what the work results in that, that counts. I believe you can love Bach without understanding fugues. I believe you can love uh, Webern without understanding all the, the arithmetic of serial music. Uh, which doesn't mean to say you might not gain benefit from knowing more. And neither Bach nor Webern, to take those two examples, show you the rules in the sand. So it's not exactly an unusual position to say, well, you, I'm afraid you can't see what the rules are here. but you, but. The, the psychological theories around this suggest that in good works like in this kind of way of looking at it, so the good works here, you do have a sense that, that you understand the structure and you can get some kind of handle on it. And that sort of tension between the work, the kind of almost knowing, of seeing that there are, that it's not random and that there is some structure there and having some idea of it. Uh, but not being able to get it directly from the work itself. Maybe it actually contributes to the experience of the work. But it's a big question, and it's an open question, and people are exploring it in all sorts of different ways as we speak.